Well, this morning I'm going to title my prophecy update while you were sleeping. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, I woke up this morning, <clears throat> I had a bunch of stuff in my news feed. Uh, I did want to remind my the people who might listen in Oklahoma that while you were sleeping, uh, Ohio State did beat Oklahoma last night. And um, it was quite a beautiful thing to watch. Uh, I didn't get to see the end of the game because it was the, I had to get up at 2.30 and finish my update, so I didn't get to see the end of the game uh, because of the rain delay or lightning delay or whatever it was, tornado delay or something out there in Oklahoma. So while you were sleeping, you know, we talk each week about the convergence of events. And each week I get close to preparing one of these updates, and I'm convinced that I'm not going to have that much to talk about until... I start checking things, and there was a lot of things that came in last night. So let's just put a couple verses to, uh, to put things in context that I'll talk about today. 2 Timothy chapter 3, the, some of the final words of the Apostle Paul, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Another verse I think is related to that, which talks about what will happen to believers during the church age, but I think it will be something that will increase as we get closer to the return of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 and 10, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Um, as I look at social media, I see a lot of things going on, and it's very troubling as to what you see. It's just this uh, contentiousness and fighting is everywhere, and everybody's offended, it seems like. For example, this is one, a high school in Texas um, at the Grand Rapids schools. They, a group of students, it was an America night, so one group of students, one student brought a Trump sign, and the other, another student uh, brought the Betsy Ross flag. And they were told by the administration that they couldn't do that anymore because it was offensive to the team that they were playing, that it was, uh, could be considered racist. So they're not allowed to do that anymore. And it's just like, you know, everybody needs to kind of get a grip I think on the way things are going, but I, I don't think it's going to get better uh, at this point. I'm, I'm an optimist that it's going to get worse, optimistic that it'll be worse. Here's a story I want to put into a little bit of context. This kind of ran around the blogosphere. Motherless babies on the way, scientists say. That was from the front page of the London Telegraph the other day. It was based on a... a a study from the University of Bath that was titled Scientists Make Mice from Non-Egg Cells, Fertilizing Embryos Instead of Eggs. Now, I don't know that the tight I, <coughs> I don't have a technical biological background, and I know that people are working to be able to do this. I'm not sure that they're there yet. Uh, science came out and had a pretty good article analyzing what they were taught. this was talking about. Motherless babies, how to create a tabloid science headline in five easy steps. And what they said was, no, that's not exactly what they did. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I do think that as we get closer to the end of time, I, I think when we talk about these things, we need to avoid being intentionally sensationalistic in the way we talk about things. We need to investigate them a little bit more. And I, I've made mistakes. It, it happens, and it's, you know, but I just think we need to be a little bit more careful before we start passing everything around that we see as if it's true, because there's a lot of stuff out there that's not true. And so I would encourage people to, um, and I do this, I always try to verify something through two or three other sources to see if it's true. Uh, and if they're just quoting the original place that I saw it, I don't consider that a verifiable source. The Daily Mail did have an article the other day called A Powerful Generation of X-Men Superhumans 
will be here in less than 100 years, claims an expert. And it was based on this book uh, by a professor at, I can't remember the name of the university, Michael Bess, called Make Way for the Superhumans. And look, this is what people really want to do. This is what the transhumanists want to do. They want to create this uh, superhuman uh, person. They want to modify genetics so we won't have disease, so we'll live longer. But eventually, you know, God said we're, it's appointed unto man once to die. So I, I think it's a pipe dream. Um, I know people live longer now. It seems like uh, the, our friends that are losing mothers and things like we have in the last year, you know, at least some of their parents have reached the age of 90, if not uh, both of them. So 90 may be the new 70, but um, this really does, is Tower, Tower of Babel type stuff where people are trying to make themselves into gods, and they fully believe that they're going to do it. I mean, they have conferences on this, and they talk about it. Now, in the... Um, Forbes magazine had two interesting articles this week. The first one was an article called, titled Evangelicals Coming Out for Darwin. <coughs> and in it, it says this. A new book put out by InterVarsity uh, Press, IVP Academic, that's InterVarsity, presents very personal testimony from evangelical science teachers, pastors, and theologians who have come to accept the broad strokes of evolutionary theory and how it has changed their views of the Bible. How I Change My Mind About Evolution represents another welcome outreach from the BioLogos Foundation, an online island of refuge for evangelical Christians who do not see the Ark Park as the future for American Christianity. And it also says in here, it uh, talks about the... Um, the people who have been involved in this project. Uh, contributors include Dennis Venema, professor of biology at Trinity Western in British Columbia, Deborah Harzma, current president of the foundation and astrophysicist trained at MIT, Francis Collins, head of the NIH, National Institutes of Health, and the founder of BioLogos. And there are a lot of pastors that have signed on to BioLogos, people like Tim Keller and that type of thing. And they really deny six-day creationism. They deny a literal uh, the, the account in Genesis is actually the way things happen. There's also a contribution from British theologian N.T. Wright, who brings his own interesting perspective from the UK, which churchgoers often find American Christian resistance to evolution bizarre. Well, I'll be honest with you, I find a lot of things where Wright is wrong. Uh, and this is another case where I think Wright is wrong, N.T. Wright. Uh, and I think he's done a lot of damage to the Christian church. The other interesting article that I think ties into this very well was, is this article in Forbes a couple days later that says, was Earth born with life on it? The article goes through, uh, looks at different things, and they conclude that, well, the fossil record is good, but it's not that good because it only has things that are preserved as fossils. Uh, for, let me give you an example. I, as I said last night in my talk, I hit a deer the other night. Uh, I'm pretty sure the deer didn't make it, although we never found the body afterwards. I think it probably crawled off someplace to expire. But that deer will never be a fossil it will just deteriorate and go away. It may be eaten by other animals, but it's not going to turn into a fossil. Um, things don't die and turn into fossils. They have to be killed in a certain way. And science looks at this and they says, wow, we had this explosion of all these fossils from this one period. But they ignore what the Bible says about what might be the explanation for when they have all the fossils. And now what they're finding is as they go back, it's, life is way too complicated to just have sprung up by chance. So they come up with the uh, Dawkins, uh, said this in one of the videos about this debate that I saw, Richard Dawkins, the great atheist, he said, well, maybe life was brought here by aliens. And that's fine. If you want to believe that, where did they get it from? How did they get it? 
and they never are able to answer that ultimate question. This is an op-ed that was on NBC News the other day. Christian universities can't have it both ways. What they say is that there are uh, a couple hundred companies have come out seeking the repeal, major corporations, Bank of America, I think Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, others have come out demanding that North Carolina undo its House Bill 2, which said that if you're born a male, you use the male bathroom. If you're born a female, you use the female bathroom. And that position, in my view, is decidedly anti-science, that you can just decide what gender you are. No, you're determined what gender you are at birth. Now, I know there are some rare examples or rare cases where that might not occur, but um, this, is, this is a problem. And so now they're coming out and they're saying, we need to get rid of Christian universities that do this. We need to get rid of corporations to do this. We need to stop doing business in states where they recognize this different difference between the sexes and, ignore, and reject the transgender, you're whatever you think you are today nonsense. Um, the NCAA this week, and, and what, they, what they've done is essentially they've weaponized sports in this regard. The NCAA, uh, as if all the, as, as everything they're doing is fine, if, as if all the players under their control are acting in a proper manner, has pulled all of its NCAA uh, tournaments and championships from the state of North Carolina. But in this op-ed at the uh, NBC News website, it talks about Christian uni universities, and it refers you to a, K, uh, a website, and now I'm going to forget what the, uh, Campus Pride is the website. And at the Campus Pride uh, website, you can go there and you can find that they have a couple of lists. They have the 2016 shame list, the absolute worst campuses for LGBTQ youth. And it has, um, it has uh, different universities listed there. I think there are 102, like Biola, Liberty. And I guess my question is, if you're a Christian campus and you're not on the list, why not? Uh, because, or maybe they just don't know about you yet. That's a, that's a possibility. But so anybody who's taking a stand, who's taking a stand for traditional values, Christian values, Christian universities and colleges, is now on the shame list. And the government's playing into this. Their post, if a, a uh, university or college requests an exemption, what they do is they post that on their website. So the uh, Campus Pride is only doing what the federal government is doing with their shame list. And they also, though, they have a top 30 list of LGBTQ friendly colleges and universities. Now, the next thing I'm going to turn to is Hillary Clinton. And we know that last week I played you a short clip of Hillary Clinton in um, a speech in New York at an LGBTQ fundraiser saying that the Trump supporters belonged in a basket of deplorables. And she came out later and made what I consider to be the classic Clinton non-apology. Well, I didn't really mean half. You know, I mean... And, but she never, she never apologized. Maybe she meant 47% of Trump supporters belong in that basket of deplorables. But I was digging around, and I found an interview that she had done a day or two before that speech in New York where she used the same language. And here's a short video clip of that. I assume even your detractors were, would agree that you're knowledgeable and, and very experienced, and even Donald Trump supporters would say, you know, he has markedly less political experience. On paper, shouldn't this race have been easier? I never expected an easy race. If I were to be grossly generalistic, I'd say you can take Trump supporters and put them in two big baskets. There are what I call the deplorables, you know, the racist and the, you know, the haters and, and the people who are drawn because they think somehow uh, he's going to restore uh, an America that no longer exists. So just eliminate them from your thinking because we've always had a kind of paranoid, prejudicial uh, element within our politics. Well, so anything that she says that what she did in New York a couple nights later, a night or two later, 
that that was an accident is just it's just a lie. Because here she was in an interview without a teleprompter or anything like that, and she said what she thought. And so she didn't do it just once, she did it twice. This is the real Hillary Clinton, that one and this one. ...have to exist in practice, not just on paper. Laws have to be backed up with resources and political will. And deep-seated cultural codes, religious beliefs, and structural biases have to be changed. In other words, if you don't agree with me, we're going to have to reprogram the way you think. That's the real Hillary Clinton. That's the real Hillary Clinton. And I'm telling you, she gets in office, she's going to do everything she can to implement things like this. So you think they're shameless now, just wait until Hillary Clinton gets in office. Now, you might think that, well, at least we're just getting Hillary, we don't have to worry about Bill. But here's an article by Jeffrey Goldberg, getting Bill out of the house. And how would they get Bill out of the house? Well, we would get Bill out of the house, he would be made a special envoy to the Middle East to finally finish what he tried to do back during his administration and failed at a number of times to achieve peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, Daniel Greenfield, at his great blog, Sultan Kanish, says this, uh, the two Clinton nuclear bombs. And he goes through an analysis and he says, listen, North Korea went nuclear during the Bill Clinton administration. And he owns that. So there really are two Clinton nuclear bombs. We dropped two on Japan. They were called uh, Fat Man and Little Boy. And he says, so today we have two Clinton nuclear bombs. We'll call the one, the North Korea one, Fat Bill. And the other is Little Hillary, which has allowed, under her guidance, Iran to go nuclear. And this is, and she, she touts her involvement in the Iran deal as a great thing, but this is not good for what's going on in the Middle East. You might want to go to Sultan Kanish blog and read that. In Europe, this uh, migrant problem, immigrant problem, still continues to be an issue. Denmark is now having problems with it. A fresh strain of a surge of migrants strains Greece. Angela Merkel, her party, only received about 30% of the vote in a recent election because people are upset with her. Uh, view of things or the, that we should just keep bringing in more and more of these people and Europe really needs to in some respects because they have an aging population they've made promises of benefits retirement benefits medical benefits to lots of people and they need workers that can come in and work and pay the taxes to support the older people so that's why the governments are willing to bring these in and as this headline from this morning's I kind of ironically Minneapolis Star Tribune Refugee numbers defy UN solutions, as do most problems in the world defy UN solutions, but people are going to try, they're going to keep trying, and the, they go to the UN for answers all the time, but they never get any solutions, just plenty of answers. Germany issued a thing this week about a threat that they believe that there are now embedded in the immigrants 520 potential attackers in Germany. Now, it's said that in law enforcement, it takes anywhere from 12 to 30 people to track one suspect on a regular basis. So if there are 500, that's what, 1,500 police officers and investigators that would be tied up potentially tracking them? There's just not enough manpower to do this. In another blog that he wrote in response to 9-11, Daniel Greenfield at Sultan Kanish said this, and I thought these were kind of astute, uh, observations. If we had been civilized, he said, then 9-11 would have been a temporary tragedy. But we, have, we had lost the ability to distinguish between ourselves and the barbarians. Out of this loss of confidence, we set out on a missionary expedition to save them by converting them to our faith and democracy. When that failed, we encouraged them to come and convert us to their faith and our inferiority and their superiority. For that, when all else is swept aside, is what Islam is. It is the conviction that the infidel is inferior and the Islamic man his superior. It is this testament of faith embodied in the cry, Allah Akbar. The barbarian measures his superiority purely in strength, 
And when civilized men lose their civilization but not their survival instincts, then they do then then they to too do likewise. When it ends in victory, the work remains unfinished. Civilizations are built by momentary are not built by momentary victories, but by character. And what he says is the West has lost its way. And I think a perfect example of this is an ad that is now running in Germany. And I'll show you, see the title of it is Turkish Women Wear the Hijab. And here's what the ad looks like on television. Ich auch. Ist doch hübsch. Enjoy difference, start tolerance. So women should wear the hijab. And this is Germany. You know, one of the great bastions of Western thought, supposedly. Well, one of the things that was in my feed this morning, a friend up in Minnesota sent this to me, because I didn't see it in my run-through of the morning news. Eight people taken to the hospital after Minnesota mall stabbings. And what you find in there is that Minnesota mall attacker referenced Allah before sta his stabbing rampage. It was at least one of the victims. Uh, I believe they've all survived. The attacker was shot dead by an off-duty police officer. And what do, you, what do you think the odds are that this mall in St. Cloud, Minnesota, Crossroads Center, is a gun-free zone? I think they're pretty high, about 100% chance that that's the case. But there was an off-duty police officer there who saw what was going on and shot the man dead, preventing further carnage. Um, and so this was not really, I, I watched, I had seen in on the television this morning, I got up about 2.30, just to see if they covered it, and I never saw this covered in the whole time that I was looking at it. Now, I might have missed it. Uh, so if I did, I apologize to CNN, but I didn't see it. Um, this was, um, the ironic thing is, I, I looked at the Star Tribune this morning, the newspaper that came out, to see if maybe this was in the Star Tribune, Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper, and it wasn't. I, it wasn't on the front page. They had an article on the front page. It was kind of, I guess this is the definition of irony. There was an article about a lady who's trying to uh, build bridges to prevent extremism from happening in the Islam, Islamic community, Muslim community there in Minnesota. And they do have, a, they do have about 120,000 Somalian Muslims in the Minneapolis area. It's the largest group of that in the country. Columbus has the second largest, about half that number. Uh, the other thing that I saw in the Star Tribune this morning was this article, Hate Crimes Against U.S. Muslims Soared in 2015. So I think the Star Tribune kind of got caught on this one, that a clearly terrorist attack happens, and they have articles about hate crimes against Muslims soaring last year. In New York City this morning, uh, yesterday morning in um, New Jersey, there was a pipe bomb uh, overnight in New York, or late last night in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan in New York City. There was an explosion, 29 injured. Reports are that there was a second, second device found. Uh, one looked to be a pressure cooker. Well, they found a pressure cooker or remnants of a pressure cooker, so they think that's what happened. Uh, I believe that the, um, uh, you know, the New York Daily News said terror bomb hits New Jersey shore race. That was in the morning on Saturday. Then there was a second device found in New York four blocks away from where the device exploded. And I believe that the New York police uh, or uh, political establishment has already come out and said that this was not terror related in any way. Like they would know that because they haven't really even identified the device that exploded, but they know what wasn't the cause. And this is what happens all the time. And so this is why when Daniel Greenfield says this in, the, in his blog about our civilization has kind of lost its way, he's exactly right. You have an example of it right here one week after the 15th anniversary of 9-11, you have all of these things, stabbing, bombs, and it's not what it obviously is. In Turkey, uh, the migrants are pouring out uh, once again. 
the other thing that's going on in Turkey is that the purge continues. They are now up to, I believe, over 100,000 people have been arrested and jailed in Turkey. Uh, and in response to that, they've had so many people. Uh, it's created a state of fear in Turkey that I'm next. For example, one person had a book in his office. I believe the man is an atheist. He's not a Muslim. But he had a book in his office by uh, Fatullah Gulan, the head of the, the supposed uh, mastermind behind the coup attempt uh, in July. I think it was July. And he was arrested and put in jail. I and mean, he's not even sure he ever read the book. And so now Turkey is proposing to handle all the people that they have put in prison. They're releasing a lot of people. And now they're proposing to build 174 new jails and prisons in Turkey to handle the people that are being imprisoned as a result of the purge. This is a thing that supposedly happened back in 2011, but just came to light this week in a tweet. Now you see the Arabic here, and you see this person, and he's obviously on a hajj to Mecca. And who is this person? Well, he's the uh, British ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Now, he went to Mecca. You can't go to Mecca unless you're a Muslim. So it's now reported publicly that back in 2011, he converted to Islam. So let's see, he converted to Islam. The mayor is Islamic. The mayor of London is Islamic. I think it's, but I think it's going to work out fine. I mentioned this video last week. I think it's a good explanation of what's going on in the area of Syria and Iraq and who's fighting who in the Middle East. So I'm going to play it now. It, it lasts about, it's just a couple minutes long. But pay attention because we're going to test you later as to who is aligned with who. What is going on in Syria? Well, it's all pretty straightforward. Turkey is attacking ISIS. Despite being widely accused of secretly helping the group for years. Turkey is also fighting Kurdish YPG fighters at the same time. Even though the YPG are battling ISIS. America is helping the Syrian Kurds. Even though the Kurds sworn enemy Turkey is America's main NATO ally in the region. Russia started arming the Kurds after the Turkish military downed a Russian jet and after a long truce Kurdish fighters have now started attacking Assad's forces. So the Kurds could be using Russian weapons to attack Russia's main ally. Moscow says it is bombing ISIS but analysts say the usual targets are other Sunni rebels, some backed by America and Britain. In Syria, the US and UK say they support secular fighters while also backing Sunni groups against the Alawite Assad regime backed by Shia Iran and the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah. In neighboring Iraq, it's the other way around. Western governments support the Shia dominated government against Sunni insurgents. So they're on the same side as Iran in Iraq, but on the other side, in Syria. In Aleppo, moderate rebels supported by America are fighting alongside a group known until recently as the Al Nusra Front, Islamists who used to be affiliated to Al Qaeda, the sworn enemy of America. Qatar and Saudi Arabia are accused of having funded the Al Nusra Front too, despite their long alliance with the US. Gulf states strongly deny financing ISIS, who are fighting Al Nusra too. Russia and Iran are on Assad's side, but have fallen out over Russia's use of Iranian air bases, while America and Britain are against Assad, but never actually attack his forces. And of course, Assad is the sworn enemy of ISIS, while allegedly buying oil from the terror group. What started as a popular revolution against the dictator has turned into a conflict engulfing the entire region. What could be simpler? <laughs> and he's right. It's extremely complicated what's going on over there. And that's just a, a very brief analysis of it. And it's very hard to tell who's fighting who and what. Now, he did mention in that video, which was done a couple weeks ago, 
that uh, we're not attacking Syrian forces until yesterday. Now, the U.S. is saying that this was a mistake, and it's not meant to, it's not meant to, it was a mistake, we didn't mean to do it. Russia has convened a meeting of the Security Council at the U.N. They're saying this is horrible, and Russia's making a lot of noise like this is the reinstitution of the Cold War, and the U.S. government, Samantha Power, and everybody's backtracking and trying to figure out how do we get out of this mess, uh, because it really has been for a while a proxy war between Russia and the United States and the United States and a bunch of other people, uh, although they don't really directly engage each other until this unintentional killing, according to the U.S. yesterday in Syria. We'll have to see whether it was intentional or not. Uh, but when you have a lot of different groups fighting each other groups and you don't know, you sometimes forget who you support at one point and not, and, you don't, and the people that you're against sometimes are in favor of you and helping you, it, it gets very complicated and mistakes happen in, in wars like this. Uh, the European leaders are debating close, proposals for closer military ties. Uh, my personal analysis of this is this is a bit of a pipe dream. They think that now that Britain is gone, which opposed a EU military force, that it'll be easier for them to do it. It might have been a while back, but right now they don't have the money. And uh, I'm not sure how they're going to do it. Uh, I suppose they could print money, but... Uh, it'll take years for them to build up a military. It's just not going to happen quickly, especially given the p political state that they're in and their declining demographics. Um, and if they don't do it soon, and the Lord doesn't come back, they may be Islamic armies anyway by the time you, know, you get 30 or 40 years down the road. This is a significant thing, Bible prophecy, because we know that there, we think there is this alliance uh, prophesied between a uh, power from the north maybe Russia and Iran or Persia. And this is an op-ed the other day in the New York Times talking about a Russian-Iranian axis. Listen to what some of this says. The partial ceasefire in Syria's civil war is welcome news, but it must not be allowed to obscure a dangerous new development, the emergence from the war of a Russian-Iranian military axis that could upset hopes for stability in the Middle East and for containing Russia's global ambitions into the future. The extent of a Russian of Russian and Iranian cooperation was signaled last month when Russia used an Iranian air base to bomb targets in Syria. American officials dismissed the event as unsurprising and tactical, but a spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry attached the words for now to his announcement that the access is finished, clearly leaving room for repetition. In fact, a Russian-Iranian bond for military cooperation is rapidly forming based on a meeting of interest between Russians competing with the West for strategic influence throughout the Middle East and Iranian hardliners seeking to dominate local and regional politics. Russia and Iran share a resentment that America can block their expansive ambitions, so they seek each other's support. They have collaborated on managing Central Asia and the Caucasus since the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. <coughs> their presidents together visited Baku, Azerbaijan's capital, and a very extremely oil-rich region, signaling unity and their influence in the Caucasus. During Syria's civil war, they have shared intelligence and coordinated military planning, and Russia has supplied advanced surface-to-air missiles to Iran. Shortly before Russia intervened in Syria a year ago, General Qassam Soleimani, who commands the Islamic Revolutionary Guard's Quds Force, was in Moscow. Over the past two years, American and Arab officials have told me the Revolutionary Guards have assembled diverse Shiite fighters from Lebanese Hezbollah members to volunteer from Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan into a force of tens of thousands in Syria. I showed you a graphic last week. They actually have more than the Syrian army there that are under direct Iranian control. They're gaining battlefield experience under Revolutionary Guards' command and can be expected to survive. The civil war is a regional asset available to any new Russian-Iranian access. To counter them, the United States has been increasing the sales of American weapons to Iran's regional rivals, led by Saudi Arabia. But this has backfired by giving Iran's hardliners another reason to strengthen their military ties with Russia. Translation, it's all very complicated, but it does seem to be fitting the pattern that we see in the way these nations are aligning in Bible prophecy. Let's go to Israel real quickly. 
high priest, second temple weight found in Jerusalem. I believe there are also some coins found that were from the second temple period. And they found a very a rich site for these archaeological discoveries. There was also supposedly a black stone that was reported on this week. I'm not sure about it yet. I'll wait for further confirmation. They also found stones that were actually from the temple area. And they actually laid them out in the pattern of what they would have been at the time of Christ. And they found those. Uh, I think they may have found those in the debris from uh, the that was taken off the Temple Mount and dumped by the Arab Muslims there when they constructed a huge expansion of the Al-Aqsa Mosque underground. I believe it seats 30, it can accommodate 30,000 people. It's a huge, huge thing. Um, we know this is prophesied. It says, I will gather all nations, in Zechariah 14, verse 2, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall be, not be cut off from the city. Why is it being attacked? Because there are Jews there. And Satan knows what God's plan is. Satan knows that God is jealous for Zion, jealous for Jerusalem, and that he intends to keep his promises to the Jewish people. And so Satan is going to do everything that he can to foment a resistance to that in that area. One of those resistances was evident in Hebron, I believe yesterday, when a Palestinian man, uh, you see here on the right, approached an Israeli soldier, talking to him, showing him some papers, and then watch what happens. So, another stabbing caught on surveillance footage. Now look, this is what the kids are taught. Here's a picture of what goes on in the Palestinian schools, the people who call themselves Palestinians, and how they are trained to attack Jews. Uh, Melanie Phillips, who I think is a great columnist, has a great article in the Jerusalem Post, I think it was Wednesday this week, Autumn for Jew bashing is beyond satire. And what she's talking about is the scandal that's taking place in England right now, uh, in Great Britain, about the Labor Party. And Jeremy Corbyn, who has been the head of the Labor Party, and his anti-Semitism, his anti-Jewishness. And it's a problem. And they keep, they're, they're sort of denying, well, this is just this one guy. And Melanie Phillips, I think, does a great analysis of what the left is saying there because they always do this. They get caught being anti-Jewish, and when you call them on it, they say, well, it's just an exception. And she says this, the Jewish labor movement is trying to save the party from being tarred with the brush of Jew baiting. This can't be tolerated because, as everyone knows, labor is anti-racist, or it is nothing. So these attitudes have to be spun as some kind of aberration. Alas, they are not. Labor's hard left leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who calls Hezbollah and Hamas his friends, can't bring himself to pronounce Israel's name, is blamed for uh, legitimizing extremist attitudes towards Israel, which have released the virus of anti-Semitism. No one ever calls mainstream progressives' opinion to account for these vicious attitudes. No one ever calls out left-wing anti-racists for supporting a Palestinian agenda, which rests on Jew-hating libels and caricatures straight out of the Nazi playbook. It is impossible for them, the left, to admit that they support an anti-Jewish agenda, even in ignorance, because if the doctrine of their own moral perfection is smashed, the whole progressive agenda goes smashed too. And she's exactly right. And I'm going to read a little bit from a Caroline Glick article from Tuesday, which builds on the same theme. Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about here, this is a shorter update than usual, uh, there was this uh, U.S.-Israel memorandum of understanding was reached regarding how uh, an aid package to Israel for the next 10 years, I believe the amount is $38 billion, spread over 10 years, but there are some, con there are some conditions in it that are different than have been in the memorandum of, under memorandum of understanding executed between Israel and the United States in the past. 
And a lot of the good analysis of this is showing that this is part, these restrictions are being put in so that Obama can publicly claim that he supports Israel greatly, he's their best friend that they've ever had, but at the same time, undermining them in some very key ways uh, and, and what they can use the money for and how they have to spend it. Things that have never been done. So uh, Shoshana Bryan over at Gatestone Institute, and she also writes for the Jewish Policy Center, wrote a couple articles about this this week, calling it an unbalanced deal. Um, and she says this, it has a few main characteristics. 100% of the money will be spent in the U.S. while Israel is presently able to spend 25% in Israel. So it does, and by not being able to spend the money in Israel, Israel is not able, it's about a billion dollars a year, that'll be taken away from spending in Israel, you know, they use that to develop their weapons. Now, under the prior agreements, they were to share that technology, I believe, with the United States. Number two, the total figure will include money for missile defense, which this in this administration has been an add-on from Congress. That makes the increasingly substantially, the increase substantially less than it appears to be. So Obama will come out and say, I'm giving them more money than ever, but He's taking away money that was given in other ways. And then this is the more, um, and I'm just not sure why Obama, who's leaving office in a couple months, or a few months, four months, is so intent on keeping Israel, uh, locking up this deal for 10 years before he leaves office. Now, look, I think if, you know, if the Republicans win, they can go in and tear this deal up and negotiate a new one. But Obama, for some reason, is trying to lock this in. And, and I think you might find out why in a minute. Israel will be prohibited from asking Congress for additional funds, effectively removing a bipartisan center of support for Israel's security from the equation and reducing Israel's flexibility in addressing rapidly emerging threats. This year, Congress wrote in $42.7 million dollars for anti-tunnel cooperation, something that emerged as essential only after the 2014 Gaza war. It has been U.S. policy for decades and law since 2008 that Israel will be made capable of defending itself against and defeating any likely combination of conventionally armed adversaries. This is known as Israel's quantitative mili qualitative military edge. Israel still receives more cutting-edge technology, but at some point, the quantity of oil-financed Arab purchases, which I mentioned earlier, can tip the quality scales. Saudi Arabia spent $9.3 billion on U.S. weapons last year. Can we close the door? Thank you. Saudi Arabia spent $9.3 billion on U.S. weapons last year. But on the other hand, having to spend all the money on U.S. procurement, U.S. arms sales to countries still in a state of war with Israel, the transfer of hundreds of millions of dollars to Iran and removing Congress from its pivotal role as a security partner for Israel are all positions that clearly express administration weariness and irritation with Israel. Now President Obama is trying Israel's hands for the future by extracting a promise that it will not approach Congress for funds in excess of those in the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, unless it is at war. This is a big change. What does that mean? Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria still maintain a state of war with Israel, as does Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, and sometimes the Palestinian Authority. Did the Obama administration leave Israel a loophole for congressional assistance? Or is it denying Israel, that Israel lives in a perpetual and evolving state of threat and often fights wars that are essential to the protection of its population, but not formally, not formally declared? Would the administration agree that the 2014 Gaza operation launched in response to the launching of more than 4,000 Hamas rockets against Israel was a war? And so what they've done is they've changed the support for Israel and its defensive operations to there almost has to be a formal declaration of war. Now why might that be? How are they going to interpret this, assuming that the left, the Democrats, win this next election? I think I know how they're going to do this. This report is out also that Obama is now aiming to define his global speech, or his global leadership in his last UN speech. 
And in connection with that, he issued a pretty strongly wordy, worded statement about Israel. They signed the deal, and then Obama takes a shot at Netanyahu. It says this in the, I think this is in the New York Times or Washington Post, a strongly worded statement raised anew the possibility, the subject of a long-running debate at the White House, that Mr. Obama might make an effort after the November election to lay out terms of a possible peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians, perhaps through introducing a resolution at the United Nations Security Council. And so AP and Washington Post, Obama is going to define his global leadership at this last speech. The Washington Post article says this, in one of his last major appearances on the world stage, maybe, <laughs> President Barack Obama will try to define how his leadership has made the planet safer and more prosperous when he gives his farewell speech to the UN General Assembly on Tuesday. It'll be interesting to see what he says. There's some reports that he might want to become the Secretary General of the UN. Obama's UN Ambassador, Samantha Powers, said that when Obama came into office in early 2009, the US was isolated. She said Obama had told fellow leaders he planned a new era of engagement that recognized countries must address common threats together. I think it's hard to overstate the transformative effect that this approach has had. You saw the video of what's going on in Syria right now. That's what the kind of policies that Barack Obama, um, that's what they lead to. And so I, I'll just be watching his speech on Tuesday at the UN. You should watch it too. As painful as it might be, it's his last one, maybe. And, um, but I, because I think, I think I'll have something significant to say. Uh, at least he'll think it's significant. Now, last week, and I'm going to finish up with this. Last week, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu made, well, he made these comments. Here's Prime Minister Netanyahu. I'm sure many of you have heard the claim that Jewish communities in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, are an obstacle to peace. I've always been perplexed by this notion because no one would seriously claim that the nearly two million Arabs living inside Israel, that they're an obstacle to peace. That's because they aren't. On the contrary, Israel's diversity shows its openness and readiness for peace. Yet the Palestinian leadership actually demands a Palestinian state with one precondition. No Jews. There's a phrase for that. It's called ethnic cleansing. And this demand is outrageous. It's even more outrageous that the world doesn't find this outrageous. Some otherwise enlightened countries even promote this outrage. Ask yourself this. Would you accept ethnic cleansing in your state, a territory without Jews, without Hispanics, without blacks? Since when is bigotry a foundation for peace? At this moment, Jewish school children in Judea Samaria are playing in sandboxes with their friends. Does their presence make peace impossible? I don't think so. I think what makes peace impossible is intolerance of others. Societies that respect all people are the ones that pursue peace. Societies that demand ethnic cleansing don't pursue peace. I envision a Middle East where young Arabs and young Jews learn together, work together, live together, side by side, in peace. Our region needs more tolerance, not less. So the next time you hear someone say, Jews can't live somewhere, let alone in their ancestral homeland. Take a moment to think of the implications. Ethnic cleansing for peace is absurd. It's about time somebody said it. I just did. Well, he did. And I would liken it to somebody throwing a truth grenade into the middle of the State Department and the Obama White House. They were outraged. It was like throwing a grenade in, a truth grenade into the middle of the UN General Assembly. Ban Ki-moon came out and called his comments on ethnic cleansing outrageous. Outrageous that Jews could live in a country that is their homeland? That's a claim, and it is ethnic cleansing. There's nothing else that you can call it is exactly right. Caroline Glick, great article. <clears throat> opinion piece in the Jerusalem Post on Tuesday, Benjamin Netanyahu and the otherwise enlightened. Because you see, this really set off the, um, the people at the State Department. They're outraged. Kerry is outraged. 
And so they trotted out one of their little robots, uh, Elizabeth Trudeau, uh, to do the press briefing on, I, it was shortly after Obama, or uh, Netanyahu, you did this a week ago, and here is Matt Lee. He's always the one who always asks the really tough questions of the State Department uh, Roboton that comes out there to do the press briefing. And this is his question and Trudeau's answer. Uh, do you see yourselves, uh, does the U.S., this administration, see itself as a target of this, this accusation? And uh, whether it does or not, what do you make of the general thought expressed? So we have seen uh, the Israeli Prime Minister's video. We obviously strongly disagree with the characterization that those who oppose settlement activity or view it as an obstacle to peace are somehow calling for ethnic cleansing of Jews from the West Bank. We believe that using that type of terminology is inappropriate and unhelpful. Settlements are a final status issue that must be resolved in negotiations between the parties. We share the view of... Now, listen. Give her some credit. She's suffering from uh, post-traumatic stress from having been blown, you know, seen a truth grenade go off right in front of her face. So she's having a little bit of trouble dealing with it. Past U.S. administration and the strong consensus of the international community that ongoing settlement activity is an obstacle to peace. We continue to call on both sides to demonstrate with actions and policies a genuine commitment to the two-state solution. We have repeatedly expressed our strong concerns that trends on the ground continue to move in the opposite direction. You know, let's be clear. The undisputed fact is that already this year, thousands of settlement units have been advanced for Israelis in the West Bank. Illegal outposts and unauthorized settlement units have been ro retroactively legalized. More West Bank land has been seized for exclusive Israeli use. And there has been a dramatic escalation of demolitions, resulting in over 700 Palestinian structures destroyed, displacing more than 1,000 Palestinians. As we've said... They're called illegal structures. They did not have any permits. You're going to call them illegal on one side. Why don't you be fair and balanced? Many times before, this does raise real questions about Israel's long-term intentions in the West Bank. Um, so you're not a big fan of the uh, video? I think. Correct. Um, so have you made your, uh, not you personally, but has the administration made its uh, feelings clear to other than your comments just now? Yes, we are, we are engaging in direct conversations with the Israeli government on this. And I mean, is there anything that is, is there anything that you can do? I, I mean, he said this, he apparently believes it, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty strong uh, sentiment. Um, you, even though you disagree with it, I mean, what have you asked him to do? I mean, have you asked him to walk it back at all? Or? You know, I'm not going to get into our diplomatic uh, discussions. What I would say is unhelpful. It's inappropriate. And, uh, well, here is uh, Caroline Glick's response to this, whatever that was. The only thing missing from Trudeau's response was an explanation of why Netanyahu was wrong. She didn't explain, nor was she asked, how the U.S.'s opposition to Israel's respect for Jewish Israelis' property rights in these areas squares with her denial that its policy supports ethnic cleansing. And she suggests that maybe the State Department should be asked these questions, and I would expand it further and say Hillary Clinton should be asked these questions if she ever has a press conference and if somebody that is a thinking person is allowed to ask her these questions. In the U.S. government's view, does Israel have the right to pass laws or ordinances for land use in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria? If not, why not? And if you do respect Israel's rights to issue rules on land use, why do you oppose the destruction of illegally built structures in Susia? Why do you oppose the legal purchase of land by Jews in the so-called outposts? And these are legal purchases of land. Under what circumstances is it legal for Jews to buy land beyond the 1949 armistice lines in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Particularly if, as you have said, you are not engaged in ethnic cleansing of Jews from those areas, when in fact you are. And then finally, under what circumstances is it legal for Jews to build homes for themselves in these areas? She continues, as Trudeau noted, the Obama administration's support for ethnic cleansing 
of Jews as a continuation and radicalization of the policies of its predecessors. Netanyahu's statement flummoxed the administration because no Israeli leader has ever stated the obvious bigotry of the U.S. position regarding the so-called settlements so pointedly. This is exactly right. To the contrary, for much of the past 20 years, in a futile attempt to mobilize international support for Israel, it has been the consistent policy of successive Israeli governments to ignore the anti-Semitic bigotry at the heart of otherwise enlightened nations' rejection of Jewish civil rights. The problem for Israeli leaders has been that the so-called two-state solution, where successive governments have been strong-armed by otherwise enlightened countries, scare quotes intended, into supporting is predicated on the ethnic cleansing of Jews. You cannot have a two-state solution unless Israel forcibly expels more than half a million Jews from their homes in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem. Matt Lee asked Trudeau whether the administration was demanding that Netanyahu walk back to his statement. You heard her at the end. Trudeau gave no answer. But it wouldn't matter if they were. It is too late. As Trudeau was failing to explain how the U.S.'s support for ethnic cleansing was anything other than support for ethnic cleansing, the Jewish press reported that the administration supported a pro-ethnic cleansing group, J Street, a lobbying group is lobbying the IRS to trample the civil rights of a group that rejects ethnic cleansing. And this is the website of the group, uh, Regavim, R-E-G-A-V-I-M. And what they do is they're telling the truth about what's going on there. They're a nonprofit in the U.S., and so J Street is trying to have the IRS revoke their tax-exempt status because it doesn't line up with the left. The tolerant left that says they're for free speech, that they're for tolerance, they're for all kinds of people living together in peace and everything. It's a big, fat lie. And Benjamin Netanyahu, bless him, finally exposed that big, fat lie. Caroline finishes up her article by saying this, Netanyahu's decision to tell the truth about the anti-Semitic nature of the anti-settlement movement was a watershed event. From now on, leaders from Ramallah to Washington to Brussels will have to account for their anti-Jewish policies. For the first time, the Israeli government has made clear that there is no distinction between the civil rights of Jews in Tel Aviv, Beit Al, or New York. Like every other national, religious, ethnic, racial, and other group in the world, Jews have the right to exercise their civil rights to property. And if the Palestinians and their otherwise enlightened supporters don't like it, that's their problem, not ours. I give a standing ovation to Caroline Glick for what she had to say, because Benjamin Netanyahu spoke the truth about the rampant Jew hatred that has existed in our world today. And it exists in our government, and God will not be mocked. God has a zealous, a jealousy for that land and for that people. They're not perfect, they make mistakes, they're in sin, but we know the promise in Scripture. I talked about it. Go look at my talk from last night on the restoration of Israel. This is what is prophesied. It is prophesied that this is going to be the condition of the world. This is exactly what's going on right now in the world. People need to wake up, pay attention, and get ready. Prepare your hearts. Prepare your minds. Stay in the Word. Trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for letting us know that, uh, what the conditions of the world would be so that we could deal with this and not have fear, but it would increase our faith and trust and hope in you as our refuge, as our supplier of everything that we need. Bless us as we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen.